All right, so um, what I was trying to do is recreate the magic of impromptu small group uh, in class work. And of course, I'm in the School of Engineering and uh, Computer Science and my class is juniors. So they're not always the most social people anyway. So in general, I put magic in quotes. <laughs> but, um, but I did in class uh, do these kind of, hey, turn to your desk partners and try this and that. Those are actually pictures from one of my old classes. Um, and so I wanted to recreate that uh, in Zoom as best I could. Now, if you're thinking, which happens to me when I go to a lot of these seminars, well, this doesn't apply to me because you know, my class doesn't do small group work or I don't have anything visual like Jesse just showed. You know, I'd encourage you to rethink your class then because, you know, hybrid or face to face next year, there should be something other than you lecturing up, you know, up at the podium the whole time. So hopefully you can find some way that what we're showing you can be used in your own class. Um, so what I tried first, um, it was random groups, which is pretty easy to do in Zoom, like click a button and everybody gets shot out into a group. And after maybe doing that twice, it did not go well at all. You know, it's random. My students don't know each other that well. It's awkward, they're quiet. Uh, so then I worked on uh, pre-assigned groups and I did it with a lot of the uh, same tools and caveats you know, if you're creating groups in your class, uh, you know, you can do with friends or I can help you meet someone or whatever. Um, but I had to do that, which I don't normally do in face to face, because in face to face classes, they normally sit near someone they know, or at least they sit in the same about place every day. So they get to know that person. And so when I say, you know, three people in a cluster work on X, at least they kind of know each other. The random uh, Zoom thing was not working at all. You know, they were thrown into these random groups. Not good. So uh, I made groups after the first week and that worked out much better, much better. So what I, one of the things I wanted to uh, tackle with you today is the idea of getting people into groups because there's a lot of, there can be problems with it. A lot of people just didn't even try it because they heard there was problems with it. And I stumbled onto a solution because I had problems with it and they didn't go away. And so I've got it, all of this will be recorded and I can also send you the slides. But you know, I did my setup and I uploaded and pre-assigned my rooms, you know, doing the best I could to make sure everybody goes to their room. But of course, out of a class of 35, you know, typically five to 10, when I sent everybody to their pre-assigned rooms, five to 10 people just, it wouldn't work for whatever reason. It has to do with, the email they're signed in under and so forth. And I didn't, but it didn't work. And so how am I going to solve that? I see there's some questions in the chat. I'm gonna wait and look at them in a minute. Um, so what I ended up doing was, I had a little spreadsheet. I have a little snapshot of it here. I had a spreadsheet of all of my students and the group they're supposed to be in. I think I had 14 groups and uh, all of them in alphabetical, alphabetical order, not group order, alphabetical order. And very quickly, this is what it would look like. And unfortunately, uh, I don't have a class going right now, so I couldn't capture a live one. But when I send people to breakout rooms, if you look over here, um, about five to 10 names would show up at the top as not assigned, even though they were. So I would very quickly, one by one, you know, look at my list, my alphabetical list. Oh, he's in G. You go over there, you click on their name, drop down list. All the rooms are there, send them to G, send them to F, send them to A. So I encourage you, if you tried breakout rooms and it was the nightmare that it can be, I encourage you to consider trying it again uh, and, and being prepared, being prepared for any kind of problem. Um, and so I just shot a couple people into their rooms. The students knew it might happen. It took maybe a minute and off they went to work. Once I got over those technical difficulties, um, the other issue was uh, moving around from breakout room to breakout room. I don't know if you tried that, but there's a delay. And when you come in, then everybody else gets quiet. Um, and I really just wanted to check on what my students are doing. Typically, I will lecture for 15 minutes, then send them into a breakout room for an activity for 15. Then I'm going to bring them back for another 40 or 30 minutes. You know, so I have a 75 minute class. Um, so I didn't, want, I didn't need to be moving around to every room, but I did want to check on the students. And so what I did was I created um, jam, a Jamboard in Google. 
Uh, it's similar to a whiteboard. It's uh, not probably as fancy as what Jesse just showed you, but it's the same idea. But what I liked about it, and let me um, show you an actual Jamboard here, is, let's see, there we go. What I liked about it is you can create the Jamboard. Can you guys see my Jamboard, Cynthia? Yep, we okay. see uh, is you create a single Jamboard with multiple pages. Every student group, I'll show you all the pages, every student group is working on their own page. And I am just moving from page to page. I'm writing on the page, I'm giving them hints, and I tell them I might put a sticky on your page. Once you've read it, go ahead and delete it and keep working. And so I was able to very quickly move throughout the work my students were doing. And again, if you don't think you have like visual work for your students to do, think again, you know, a, a concept map or a, the Center for Teaching's got a million ideas. Uh, in this one, I had given them these um, sticky notes and uh, they had to arrange them in a particular order. And then they had to write down some answers to some of the stuff they were working on. And so you can see the students created some pretty interesting stuff. I was able to check on them. I was able to comment on their work. I gave them, you know, a green check when they got the first part done. And, um, and I never actually went into any of their rooms. And so that was much, much quicker than trying to move around the room. So that's setting up rooms in Zoom and being prepared for students who might not get into a room properly. And then creating what I used was a multi-page whiteboard so that every group was on their own whiteboard. So here I just have some tips, um, you know, to, to, I, I had to create like, I don't know, 11 different pages every time because I had 11 groups or 14 groups. So I can create a single page and then paste my questions on it, uh, paste the sticky notes. I made templates so that I could reuse them at every class. Uh, like I said, I can write on the page. I can put a sticky note on the page. Um, this is the name of the cohort. So that was already there. The students knew where to go. They could adjust the names of all the students who weren't there that day. Um, and it just allowed me to come in and out of the class very quickly. So that was my idea of how to kind of recreate small group work um, when they were on Zoom. And uh, I will say my class is a hybrid class. So about half the students are in class and half are on Zoom. Some of the small groups, they were all in the room, but since they couldn't be physically close, you know, this was fine for them anyway. Some were all in China and some were mixed uh, and off they went. Um, to this board. Now, will I use it when my class is fully face to face again? I actually kind of want to because uh, I want to be able to see what they're doing. I mean, I can walk around the classroom, but I'd rather just peek in on their board. So I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to do it. Um, I'll just share uh, pretty much my disaster of class organization. I reorganized my class webpage every day up until the fifth day of class. I mean, I went even beyond class starting. Like through classes, I was still trying to fix it. I really had a hard time. And I believe my problem was, I was trying to serve you know, my remote students who never came to class, my live students, and I was using resources I had used a summer ago from a fully online course. And it just makes a match. It was very difficult. So on the right, you know, I tried to do what I learned in OCDI. Um, by doing some, you know, making some banners and, uh, but I didn't have, it wasn't a nice uh, checklist ordering like Jesse had because um, some students didn't need all the resources. It depended on if you went to class or if you wanted to do extra credit. So, so here's all the resources. Then I ended up creating a separate map every module that said, you know, if, if you're a hybrid student, just come to class. If you're an asynchronous student, access these things in this order. So it was okay, but, but I've still got work to do. I don't know. It was tough, but I think the visuals at least helped a little bit. Um, one thing I will just add, because I'm running out of time, uh, I, I have it up here on this slide, is um, twice during the semester, I created kind of a break for the students where I laid out all their work and then up in this upper picture, I gave them advice on how they could arrange the work to create a few continuous days with no work. Now, whether they did that or not, I'll, I don't, I'll never know. But, um, you know, I did a make your own fall break. And then one time I gave them an in-person exam. And if you weren't taking the exam, which half the students weren't, um, this is how you arrange your work. So it was something, just trying to, you know, give 
give the kids a little break. Um, and this year with our, um, with our uh, reading days, you might want to try something like that. So that was May. <laughs>